You discussed your interviews with several public figures in the black community in the US and South Africa who have made a major contribution to the rights of black people in their communities. Can you briefly discuss them? Well, you know, over the years I've, I've come to work and know several um, famous people, uh, you know, in the 1960s, I got to meet Huey Newton through my professor Blake. Um, and probably most recently, I worked with um, Sterling Brown. I worked with him in nineteen late 1990s. He's now a very famous, uh, you know, a very famous um, actor. actor um, and this is, this is us and so on. Yeah, I talk, he's in this, this book, uh, Sterling Brown. He, he also... He gave the commencement speech at Stanford, um, but he, um, in his speech, he said, his commencement speech, he said, I took John Wickford's course in African-American English. I, 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 I could hug him at that point for that. Uh, I, I did. <laughs> Anyhow, but, you know, there are two figures I want to single out. Um, I learned a lot from interviewing Dennis um, uh, August Wilson. But I, in particular, I wanted to focus on Rosa Parks, um, the civil rights icon. Um, she, she came to Stanford in 1990. Uh, well, here she is, Rosa Parks. And this is a picture I have in the book with um, her, with Angela and I. Um, and um, she was a very striking person. You know, she, she came into our, um, we had a little apartment next to the dorm. We were resident fellows, so we lived next to the dorm, and we produced academic programs for the dorm. And she came into our little apartment, and she sat down. And our, our, our son, Russell. No, Luke. Uh, Luke, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> who, we have several poems by him in, in the last chapter. But he was only five at the time. So he jumped into her lap. And I said, no, 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 no. no. This is Rosa Parks. You know? <laughs> I didn't say that, but, you know. Um, and she said, no. Please leave him. And I learned later in reading about it, she, she had no children of her own, and she loved children, mm -hmm. um, and she played with him and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I remember about that visit, she was with us. She, she, she came to us uh, for two days. Did not see him at the apartment, but um, she had a press conference where she talked about the things that led her to not give up a seat on the bus. People, people often think that she was tired. Well, she was tired, but um, she had many experiences that really made her mad. One, one of them that really sh struck me was that the black passengers would go to the front and they'd pay their money, but then they couldn't walk through the white area. They would have to go out and come in on the back door. And very often, while they were, wait, while they were coming, trying to get back in, the bus driver would drive about 10 feet. They would have to run to get on the bus and drive another 10 feet or so. So it was very humiliating. And also, many of the children, that, that the young people that you work with, said that when they would pull the cord, ask it to be let off at the next stop, the, the, the bus driver would ignore them and might drop them off 10 blocks away from where they wanted to go. Um, so that and the fact that she was... She had been um, uh, socialized in many meetings of the um, with, with outstanding figures uh, in the civil rights movement. Um, showed that, in fact, she had a whole background in activism, which she then brought into the fore when she didn't give up her seat. But in Chapter 14, uh, when we, um, another professor and I, David Abernethy and I, were teaching at the Stanford campus in Oxford, um, we brought Dennis Brutus um, to give a talk. I'd never known about Dennis Brutus before, even though he had talked at Stanford before, actually. Um, he had been shot in the chest for trying to integrate South African teams to include um, Black South Africans. In fact, he started Sandrock, South African non-racial Olympic Committee. There was, a, there was a regular Olympic Committee, and it never included any blacks. The Olympics was South African Olympics was always white Olympics. Um, so he had been jailed in a cell next to Mandela on Robbins Island. 
but largely through his efforts, um, South Africa was allowed to compete in the Olympics for the first time in, and in 1966. And Josia Togwana became the first South African to win an Olympic gold with a victory in the marathon. So I did an interview, a long interview with, 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 with um, Dennis Putas. He talked about those experiences. Uh, and I was very struck by the power of, of the experiences. And also, um, as it came out later, you know, it, it, it you know, he, he suffered all kinds of um, personal. Uh, he had like a, a breakdown, with it, as you well imagine. But I also mentioned in that chapter that you know when we organized this special session uh, in at at Sanford in Oxford, we called it Britain in the Third World, the Third World in Britain. Because in many ways, the children and grandchildren of those immigrants um, have gone on to do outstanding things in Britain itself. Uh, even um, Dennis Boutas made very valiant contributions to Britain. And one of the last people that I wanted to mention, I mentioned in my chapter, was a great niece of mine, um, uh, Ubaya Garcia, Garcia. Uh, who is a trumpeter. Uh, and very, very famous, um, and have a picture of her in there. So it is one in many ways in which um, the, the Britain, of course, did a lot in the third world, some good, some bad, and um, West Indians and Africans and other parts of the third world have made valuable contributions to also to British life. Thank you.